see. I was uh, speaking to the students in the class beforehand and I said, I, you know, my hypothesis was that generally environmental studies students have not taken courses in marketing before. Um, and uh, that was true of all of the students uh, in my class here. So none of them have any background in marketing. I'm gonna, yeah, I was thinking about that. I was writing my, my slides. And uh, so I'll have to do a little bit of explaining and terminology, I think. And, and I spoke with Savannah a little bit earlier as well. And that was also the case. She was really good about just saying, and what is that again? I was like, right. <laughs> Okay, and let me know when I should repost that link as well, Elena, for the uh, oh, right. the polling um, software. It's it's on the slides, but it's easier just to click the link, I think, for people that want to participate. And uh, yeah, um, so I assume um, I assume that when people log on, they would see what's in the chat. Um, so they may just have to maybe, open it. yeah, they may, um, so I might just say, uh, in my, in my welcome here, um, give myself a note there. I'll just announce it so that it is clear, um, where yeah. they can, and they can just do it, you know, on their phone through a web browser on their phone or, uh, or on their computer. Okay. Right. It's convenient. It's more convenient to use the other piece of technology. So if they're watching on the computer, if they have their phone open to do that. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Well, I um, expect that there will be folks that will continue to trickle in a little bit here, um, sure. but I will um, I will kick us off here with our welcome. And uh, if you're all set, we'll do that. All right. Um, so then, uh, welcome everyone to tonight's Green Living seminar presentation. Again, really nice to see um, some familiar names joining us. We're glad that you're here. I'm Elena Traster, if you don't know me, I am a professor in the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts Environmental Studies Department. This semester's Green Living Seminar is organized around the theme, Individual Actions and Environmental Sustainability. All of these webinars are free and open to the public. They take place on Wednesdays at 3.30, uh, 5.30, sorry. You can register online at www.mcla.edu slash greenliving. And there you can also find links to videos and podcasts of our previous presentations um, on our YouTube channel. Today's presentation uh, will go for about 40 minutes um, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. You'll see that there's a Q&A box uh, and you are welcome to enter your questions there at any point and then we'll get to those at that Q&A session at the end. You'll also see in the chat that there's a link uh, that our speaker is going to be using to allow you to uh, participate throughout today's presentation. So um, if you'd like to take out perhaps another device, um, it might be more convenient if you'd like to log in there, if you'd like to participate that way, um, you'd be welcome to do that or you can do it on uh, your computer. Um, but uh, feel free to check out the chat and uh, click on that link if you would like to. Um, join the interactive components of today's presentation. If you can't see it in the chat, uh, feel free to send me a chat. We'll figure it out. So a quick plug for next uh, week's presentation. We hope you'll also join us next week, February 24th, when Lori Bird, Director of the World Resources Institute U.S. Energy Program and the Polsky Chair for Renewable Energy will present a lecture titled Factors that Influence Demand for Green Power. Today's presentation on consumer demand for fuel efficient vehicles and the role of social marketing will be given by Dr. Lisa Watson, 
she is Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Programs and Associate Professor of Marketing at University of Virginia. And we are really happy to have you here. Thanks so much for doing this. I'll turn My it pleasure. over to you. Thank you. All right, it's over to me. So thank you everyone for having me today. I'm super excited to be invited uh, to talk about fuel efficient vehicles, social marketing, consumer demand. Uh, my area is consumer psychology and what makes people tick and how people make decisions. So this is the thing that I spend my entire life doing. Um, and I'm imagining you don't really want to spend a whole over half hour listening to me chat directly at you. Uh, so that is what the polling is for. I'm going to ask you some questions and I'm also going to ask other questions. So I would like you to keep that chat box open. Uh, so that you're able to respond to some of those questions and it'll make it a little bit more fun. Okay, uh, so that pollev.com slash Lisa Watson 500, that is me, that is where those questions will appear for you to answer. Okay, uh, and there's lots of space. So I encourage you right now to flip open that computer, turn it on uh, and make that happen. Okay. We all good? I'll give you a minute to do that. A quick bit of explanation about me that might be helpful. Uh, I am coming to you from Canada uh, in the middle of the prairies where it is freezing, freezing cold, but we also spell things a little bit differently. And I noticed, you know, I was putting use in the word behavior uh, and doing some interesting things. So if I use strange terminology or talk about, you know, kilometers per liter, uh, kindly forgive me, um, making that mental switch uh, between the countries is a little bit tricky. Okay, with that in mind, uh, I am just going to say, are you with me? And a whole bunch of people apparently have logged in and are indeed with me asking, answering those questions. Uh, so this is just my way to make sure that my technology is actually working. So we have eight folks online that have responded. Please feel free for the other eight or so of you to pop in and join at any time. Okay, yeah, and that number is climbing, so that's really great. Okay, so what am I going to be talking about today? There are, whoops, there are three components to my talk. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about fuel efficient vehicles generally uh, and how those things are being defined and how we're going to approach it. We're going to talk about consumer behavior or consumer demand. Uh, and what, again, how people kind of function and what's their psychology. And then the third part is really the marketing piece. So that's the social marketing relation. Social marketing actually isn't social media marketing. It's about making people make better choices. So it's about changing people's behavior and using the marketing toolkit to make that happen. Okay, so that's where we're going from there. Okay. So when I'm talking about fuel efficient vehicles, and I do know that in a couple of weeks, I think someone's talking exclusively about electric vehicles, um, but I am going to be talking a little bit about those today as well, because they are classified, they're the most fuel efficient uh, of all the vehicles. Um, so the terminology, so we're going to talk about conventional fuel efficient vehicles. So you'll see the term FEV. So that's just fuel efficient vehicle throughout here. And we will also be talking about alternative or alternate fuel vehicles. Uh, and whenever it says EV, uh, that's the electric vehicle. And we will mention hybrids, but for the most part, we'll talk about the two extremes. So we'll talk about gas powered cars that are more fuel efficient than others. And then we'll probably mostly start shifting over to electric vehicles as well. So that gives you an idea of where we're looking. Okay, so the ones that use gas, ones that don't need to be plugged in, those kinds of things, simple right? Fuel efficient, the alternate, those are the ones got to plug into a wall if you want them to keep going. So that's where we're going to look at it. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, what are the two key differences from a consumer's viewpoint when you're talking about a gas powered versus an electric fuel efficient vehicle? Okay. Um, so first up is cost. Okay. So the idea for uh, um, uh, the cost of ownership, sorry, um, is that you have an upfront cost typically for an electric car is higher. Okay, so they're more expensive to buy upfront, but then they become less expensive over time. So where you're comfortable or what your, your psychology is when you're buying the car is going to tell you where you're going to anchor. 
right? Is it going to be like, whoa, that's a, you know, that's really expensive or you'll so actually that's a bargain. So we have to think about the, the psychology behind that, okay? Um, again, there's also a lot of controversy around which one is actually cheaper. Uh, and, and you can read five different articles and you have five different answers. Um, so again, the confusion that people have around the issue of cost of ownership is something that's legitimate, um, but also the quantification. So not only is it confusing, uh, but there's going to be that tipping point, right, in terms of where you do start to see the bang for your buck uh, from buying one car versus the other. And the average length of car ownership in North America is only five or six years, right? So in the short term, again, unless you're gonna hold on to that car for a while, right? Where is it gonna get the best bang for your buck? And quite frankly, if you look at the majority of the literature and you decide to anchor on where, where does the middle fall, right? So I read 12 different articles, six say, you know, you know, the you know, return on investment happens here, six say it happens way over here. Uh, the average comes out to be about five or six years. So actually you're breaking even on an electric vehicle for about as long as people choose to own them. So where is that extra benefit for making that choice one way or the other if it's not on cost? It has to be somewhere else in terms of people's psychology, okay? Uh, and then the other side of the coin that makes them really different is the infrastructure around them, right? So gas, car, gas powered cars have been around as long as there have been cars, uh, electric, ve and electric vehicles less so, right? So there are gas stations all over the country, charging stations are a little fewer and further between. And so that's where you get that panic. Some people have, and it's called range, range anxiety, actually as a term, right? That says, am I gonna be able to get where I need to go with the amount of power I have available, okay? And again, realistically, and this number is specific to the US, um, the majority of trips are less than 50 miles. And that is more than enough to get for most people's trips, they fall well under, I think 98% of trips that people take in their cars are under that distance. So range anxiety for most people actually shouldn't be a concern, but again, it doesn't mean it isn't, right? So that idea of the psychology of it versus the reality, ideal and perception, right? So my entire existence around consumer psychology is how people think, not what is actually true. Um, so figuring out those hurdles are part of the thing as well, okay? So the last thing that I want us to do, this is where I want you to pull out your, whoop, where did it go? I want you, here we go. I want you to pull out your phone or your computer or whatever it is again. And I want you to think about, and you'll answer each of these individually. So answer one question at a time. How do you think people choose a car? Okay, so what product feature do they use, right? And pick what you think the most important three are when buying a car, okay? And so enter one, then hit submit, enter another, hit submit, enter another, hit submit, up to three. You don't have to submit three, but think about what you think those most important issues are. Because this really drives everything we do. Pardon the pun, it drives everything we do. <laughs> Okay, so we're starting to see some of these answers. We have safety, price, cost. Okay, what are some other, other issues that you think are important? How do you, like, how would you buy a car? If you were gonna buy a car tomorrow, what was the number one thing you'd look for? I knew color was gonna show, it, show up in there. <laughs> color is actually totally legit. Lots of people will pick a car on color. Okay. And I will give you a couple extra seconds to put these in, right? But look at some of those numbers, right? And I recognize you're also college students. So we have price, we have cost, right? There's all the economy, right? So we have a lot of the idea of like how much you can pay for a car, but that's consistent with what we just saw on the previous slide. So it's not unique to what you would call your market segment, right? But definitely a thing, okay? And so what you're seeing is reasonably true, okay? Um, some with a little bit of a different ratio, I think, based on your numbers. So I'm just watching your, your, the screen change over here in case you're wondering when I'm not looking at you, this is where I see your answers. Um, so reliability, function, speed, style, right? Miles per gallon, okay? Um, so you're really kind, right? I'm seeing fuel, right? You know, 
cost, those kind of popularity, right? In reality, let's look at what the what the data actually tells us about how people buy cars. Okay, and think about the ads you see for cars. The ads are remarkably reflective of what people want. Not surprisingly, the marketers have done their homework, right? The advertisers know what those key components and issues are. And so the number one feature by far is performance. Okay? And what does performance mean? It means speed, handling, right? The pickup, um, all those kinds of things that make the car drive nicely. And again, it's a pretty macho approach, right? But it's very much about power, right? So, you know, how many horses are under the hood, those kinds of things, right? If you think about the psychology, again, of people when they're buying a car, right? Do you think that the idea of how powerful a car is and how fuel efficient a car is matches, right? They tend to be negatively related in people's heads. Right. So if it's high performance, clearly it's also not going to be fuel efficient and vice versa. So performance wins. Right. It is the number one thing that people look for, followed by price. Right. Um, and again, whether that's a hard price or just, you know, value for dollar based on the class of car you're buying, uh, that makes a difference. Right. But people are still looking for that price tag. So when we know that electrical vehicles are more expensive, right? The price matters. And when I talk about price there, it really is that initial upfront cost of the car, right? That they're looking at. Okay. The third one, and this showed up a lot in your answers as well, that idea of style, comfort. Okay. And this can be a couple of different things, right? So it's basically the interior or how, how sexy it looks, right? So that goes back to color would fall under this category too, right? <laughs> so, and again, how realistic, right? So think about psychology again, this is probably the second biggest purchase most people ever make other than buying a home. And think about how irrational a lot of people are in choosing it, right? Oh, it looks pretty, I'm gonna buy it, right? And it's, it's true, right? And people do the same thing when they're buying a home. They walk into the house and go, it just feels right. So I'm gonna buy it, okay? So the idea of a spreadsheet and doing all the math and figuring out, you know, where the biggest bang for the buck is and what my break even point is for buying a car, you know, that's more or less fuel efficient. It doesn't really happen. People don't really necessarily do it. So we need to think about what the ways are that we can reach people, right, for doing that. Okay, the fourth one is lifestyle. And it is often tied very closely to the style or the comfort of the car. Uh, and of course, I have a picture here of, you know, the SUV and the great outdoors, okay? Uh, and I love SUV commercials because over half of them have people driving around, camping. 95% of SUVs never leave a city, right? But it's the idea that you could if you wanted to, right? <laughs> that people are, are really buying into. Um, and the fact that they have families, right? And so there's more space in an SUV and minivans are just, nobody wants to admit to owning a minivan right so this is the you know this is the alternative uh, for families uh, to make sure that everybody fits and everybody in the family is comfortable right so they they get tied very very closely together and way down the list and and i'm i will commend you because many of you said safety um safety is actually quite low on the list <laughs> and it's right down right down there uh, with fuel efficiency so those are the two that are kind of less important in terms of the things that people are looking for. Now, to be fair with safety, I don't think it's because people don't think it's important, but it's one of those things that people assume, right? So it's kind of like if you buy, and I, I give an entire lecture uh, in, at my university on toothpaste, right? And I talk about, you kind of have to assume that your toothpaste, every toothpaste on the shelf cleans your teeth or it wouldn't be on the shelf. Right. And it's kind of the same with cars, right? The amount of testing that they have to go through to be considered roadworthy to go on the road uh, means that there's a base assumption that all cars are safe. And so it's only a very select group of people that are looking for that extra. Right. And Volvo is a brand that is anchored very heavily um, on that extra safety feature when they market their car, but most don't because it's not heavily in demand. It's all those other things uh, that are more in demand. Okay, and fuel efficiency and environmental environmental impact way down there. Okay, and actually fuel efficiency at least this is the 
the most positive thing I can say about people wanting a fuel efficient car, it's usually tied to price, right? And the long-term maintenance cost of your car. Uh, and whenever fuel prices skyrocket, which they do every once in a while, right? It's a market-based system. Uh, when they skyrocket for remotely long periods of time, people do tend to start buying more fuel efficient and smaller cars, but it lasts for a very short amount of time. And as soon as gas prices drop again, right? That length of ownership of five to six years, the people that bought the car because they thought they had to, they sell it and they go back to buying that pickup truck or that bigger car, right? And so I would liken that to um, even a place like McDonald's, right? Every once in a while, you know, something hits the news about how, you know, they're extremely unhealthy. And so they, you know, say, oh, here's our salads, here are all, are all, all of our healthy foods. And consumers go out and buy them for about a month. Uh, and then they go back to buying the Big Mac again, right? <laughs> so it's kind of the same, right? It's whatever is immediate and salient. And so when it's hitting your pocketbook, it's a big deal, um, but it's often very short term. Okay, so how do we then convince people when they've already told us with their wallets that fuel efficiency actually isn't that important to me, how do we convince them that it is, right? Um, and so the first thing that we need to understand is kind of where people sit and what makes them tick, right? And so that's where the idea of the consumer demand and consumer behavior comes in, okay? And what we know about sustainability, and this is a very simple, this is like the most simple view because we only have a half an hour, an hour. We don't have a week or an entire course. Your other speakers will talk about others of these issues along the way. Um, but two of the key decisions that people make or the, the things that are important to them when they're deciding whether or not to behave sustainably or not, and it doesn't matter if it's cars or anything else, is how convenient is it and how important is it, okay? And so the importance factor uh, you know, that's very much about like how significant do I think climate change is? How quickly do I think it's going to impact me and my family? Is it something that's, you know, decades off and I'm just not going to have kids anyway, so I don't care? Or is it, oh my goodness, it was minus 62 degrees in my city yesterday. I'm not kidding. Minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's not normal. We're starting to see climate change. We've seen all the wildfires in Australia, right? Things are happening, right? So is that salient enough to me that I think it's important for me to act, okay? Uh, if you do think it is significant and you think it's important and you think it's shorter term and closer to you, you're more likely to be willing to sacrifice is what I would call it, right? And make behavioral changes that are inconvenient to make the difference, okay? That leads to the other side of the coin, the convenience side. Right? Most people, if you, you have to choose between whether something is, you know, oh, well, choose an environmentally friendly product or not, right? Most people, if all things being equal, they're happy to do it, right? So as long as it has no difference, if it's not a difference in cost, if it's a super easy decision to make. So the more convenient we can make things for people, the better. And usually what that means is I'll just throw money at the problem. <laughs> so I can just buy this or I can buy that, but I don't actually have to do much of anything different. Right? Um, now, having said that, we're only willing to pay. There's a big difference. And I think I put this on a slide somewhere. Um, but we used to be, we used to say that truly sustainable consumers were willing to pay 10, 20, 30 percent more um, for a product that was better for the environment. Those numbers are changing quickly over the last few years, they're actually down to about 5%, right? So I might pay 5% more. That's not a whole lot. Um, and if anything, we're just starting to see a new trend where people will actually want to punish environmentally unsustainable products. So rather than being willing to pay a premium for those that are sustainable, they expect to pay less for ones that are not. So that's, a, I mean, it doesn't sound that different, right? One still more and one still less, but it's a framing issue, right? In terms of understanding how that information is presented. So all of these things in the psychology become important, okay? So what we want to think is how do you think about these two anchors will fit as it pertains to cars and fuel efficient cars, okay? So the next piece of the puzzle that we want to think about when we 
when we're moving into that, okay? Um, so where does the convenience come in? Where does the importance come in? Is understanding a little bit more about what market segments there are for cars. And so in marketing, what we do is we choose target markets for different kinds of products, okay? So that means we find different, different groups of people that have similar likes and dislikes, right? Whatever those kinds of things. And we group them together and we say, those people are probably really good customers for this product. And those people are probably really good customers for another product, okay? And so in the area of socially conscious or sustainable behavior, right? We can group customers into six different categories that really can be broken down into groups of two. So that's what you see here. Uh, and when we're talking about, well, just about anything, I guess, in terms of sustainability, there are a bunch of people that are just gonna be on board no matter what, right? And so, um, and so the committed activists is what I'm calling, calling them here, right? It doesn't matter what you do, they're into the, you know, they think it's highly important, right? Climate change is important to me. And so I will go the extra mile to make sure I'm doing everything I can do. We have the con concerned convenience person that if you make it remotely easy for me to do it, I am going to do it, right? So that means we have about 35% of the market that are generally on board with fuel efficiency, fuel economy. And again, that means less emissions, right? And you know, more environmentally sustainable um, behavior, okay? So, all right, we got 35% of the market. We're doing okay, it's pretty good, right? Then we have the other end of the scale. So I'm gonna jump down to the low relevance group, okay? So those are the people that, I mean, it doesn't matter what you do, right? The active avoider, as I have called them, they're the ones that are just like, climate is not my problem. I don't really care. I will use all the plastic, right? I will, you know, wear all the seal skin. I like, bleh, right? I don't really care at all. And nothing you do is gonna change my mind. Right? And they're about 10% or so of the population. And then we have the, what I've called apathetic awareness people, right? So they know, okay, yeah, climate change might be a thing, uh, but I don't care enough to do anything about it, right? It's, it's anything is too inconvenient for me, right? So I'm not even gonna worry about it. And I'm just gonna go about my merry way and not let that factor into my skill set or decision set. So if you think about it, that is a quarter of the market that is just gone to you. So you've got 35% on board, you've got 25% gone. It's the middle that are actually of interest, right? This is where the marketers put most of their focus. It's on that medium relevance 40%. They're also the largest chunk of the market and they're about evenly split, okay? So the keen but confused group are the people that just say, man, I wanna do the right thing, but I don't know how, right? And so if you think back to even the idea of cost of ownership that we talked about early when you're buying a fuel efficient vehicle, right? Where is the break even point? Is it actually better? I don't really know, I can't tell, right? Do the difference in emissions really make up for the fact that there's a huge battery and there's a whole new set of infrastructure that we have to build out there in the, in the world that then has to be, you know, end up in a landfill or something. Um, so it's the idea of sustainability is never really black and white. So we need to help them basically understand what the good choices are and what the less desirable choices are, okay? And then we have the other group. I call these the bandwagon hoppers. These are the guys will do anything that's in fashion, right? Now, fortunately for us, sustainability is in fashion, right? <laughs> so this is a great time to get people on board with doing things that, that will work and will make a difference. Um, having said that, so think about the whole straw fiasco right, that, that happened recently. And, you know, we can't have plastic straws anymore because they're killing the environment. They have been doing that for decades, but it suddenly became popular, right? And no one complained about the plastic lid that the straw goes through, but everyone went crazy about the straw, right? And now we're all carrying metal straws around our purses, right? Well, that's actually, I'm not complaining because it's a step in the right direction, right? But that's where the fashion trend people hop on board and they give you enough critical mass, right? That between all those different segments, it does actually start, you start to see a difference, you know, in the overall use uh, and overall reduce of waste. So it's the same thing when we're talking about cars, right? If we can get more people in that segment to get on board, 
And think about how difficult it is when people want cars that are based on fashion and style and power, right? And things that they would be drawn to, how do we make fuel efficiency look fashionable and trendy, right? So that's kind of what we're up against in terms of making some of these decisions, okay? And so we know what we're up against. What is our toolkit for making those differences and changes happen, okay? And so social marketing, like I said, it's really about making people change behavior, but the only way that it's gonna be successful Okay, and this is, the, this is the only citation I have in my entire slide deck, uh, okay, is um, you want to create exchanges. So marketing is about buying and selling stuff, right? Giving and taking in a way that both parties get value, right? So it's no different here. So we want to create exchanges with customers that satisfy both the customer's self-interest and the public good, okay? So not necessarily just the company selling, but the overall public is gonna benefit from the decisions that they're making. And so other places that you see social marketing happen. Um, so think about like just trying to get people to stop smoking, don't drink and drive, right? Anti-obesity campaigns, right? You know, to, to make your entire society healthier, right? And I've worked in all of those areas as well. Okay, <laughs> so um, all of the same principles uh, will apply in all these instances. And so our toolkit, is educating people, okay, uh, marketing to people, okay, and the marketing toolkit uh, is, you know, an in, you know, an entire set of tools in and of itself, and then we also use legislation, right, um, to say, hey, actually, if you're not really willing to make these changes on your own, we'll help you along, right, so if you want to look at it, education is just information, marketing are kind of the carrots, right, or the incentives, and then legislation is kind of the sticks, right, for pushing you along if you're not willing to do it on your own, okay. So in the case of cars, right, and fuel efficient cars, what are some of the ways that we can get that information across, okay. So it's things like public relations, media campaigns, getting consumer reports to talk and do stories, car and driver, right, do these comparisons, right, and figure out, help people figure out what the right choices and decisions are for them, right, in a way that deals with that level of sustainability and what the pros and the cons are, okay. Uh, again, public service announcements, those are the kinds of things I was talking about where it's government advertising campaigns, right, so the government actively is the one going out there and trying to sell the good decision rather than the, the, the car company that might not actually have as much of a vested interest in helping people make that decision because their bigger vehicles are usually higher fuel consumption and higher market, right? So it's up to the government to step in and make those kinds of pieces of information available instead, okay? And so on the other side of legislation, right? How do we always make people do what we want them to do, right? We hit them in the pocketbook. Uh, it's usually the way it is, so taxes, um, is one of the best ways to say, hey, we're going to make this more expensive for you, actually. So if you make a bad decision, uh, we're going to make your gas more expensive, right? Uh, and the other way that we're seeing it being done now is through emissions testing, right? So if your car is emitting too many, um, you know, too much CO2 or too many, too many fumes, you're just not going to be allowed to drive it, right? So you're going to need a whole new car. Um, a whole new car is a very expensive proposition <laughs> when you're looking at the, the thing all put together, okay? And then the marketing toolkit. Um, so the four P's of marketing are product, place, price, and promotion. And so that's the toolkit that we tend to use when we decide how we want to help incent people to make those buying decisions that we want them to make. So some of the things that we would anchor on in the case of cars uh, again, it's the idea of product fo focusing on product features uh, that are attractive, okay? And so making a particular brand or a particular class of car, right, look more appealing uh, in particular kinds of advertising. So way back in the day when hybrids were brand new, the Prius, Toyota Prius was the first one that really decided to take the fashion approach. Uh, and become a brand that was a celebrity brand. So they gave them all to, you know, the celebrities to drive to the Oscars and it became popular to have a hybrid, okay? Now we have Tesla, right? 
everyone wants a Tesla, right? Look at how expensive Teslas are. They're massively expensive, but everyone would love to have one just because it's a sexy brand, right? It's associated with Elon Musk. How can you go wrong? Right. So that's a big deal. And again, the idea of bringing on influencers, whether it be celebrities or in social media, those are the people that people are going to listen to. Uh, and then in the pricing side of things, we also have the idea of rebate programs. Okay. So it's kind of like discounting, but it's run by the government, right? The company has no incentive to have you buy the cheaper car. They're not going to have any incentive to give you the cheaper car at a cheaper price. So what happens instead is if you buy a you know, a fuel efficient car of some kind, the government says, I will reward you for that choice and I'll give you $5,000 back, right? To help offset that initial decision that you made on buying that big purchase, right? So we have a lot of tools when you put them all together can help different segments make the kinds of decisions that you want them to make, okay? So get ready to pull out your question deck again. Okay, so look at who we're looking at here. So what I want you to think about, and this is just a click on a picture, okay, um, to see which one you think. So if you think about your activists and your concerns, so those are those two high relevance segments that we were talking about earlier. Which tool in the toolkit in education, marketing, or legislation do you think would be most important for their decision making? How do you think we can get them to change their behavior most easily? Which would you say, is it about educating? Is it about marketing tools? Or would it be about the legislating? Which one, which one do you think would work the best? And so you can just click on a picture. If you're not sure, you can click on two. Uh, if you wanna hedge your bets a little bit, clicking on three is kind of pointless. But. <laughs> so what do you think? if you had to make a decision. So right now we've got a bit of an even split between education and marketing. And a couple, yeah, so legislation is a little bit lower in terms of those overall numbers. Okay, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so education is coming out a little bit ahead, okay? And so what is it about education that makes it most attractive to say an activist? Okay, so if you had to just give me a quick why, in the chat box, what would you say? What made you choose education to our top, our top category of respondent? So this is an experiment. But I don't know how talkative this group is. Okay, they respond to knowledge. Okay, so they're kind of seeking out the facts and the figures. In the know, educated. Yep. Okay, right? so they like to be able to tell people what to do. We would call those, you know, kind of the market experts or market mavens, uh, if you would, in our in our field. Okay, they're already motivated. They just need to know which way to go, right? So all of this is absolutely correct. Um, oh, Elena even responded. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so usually we can get away with just, and I say just education, because that's kind of our base level tool, or it's the easiest tool to activate with this group of people, okay? Now, what if I had asked you the same question about the keen but confused group? Where do you think we would go with the keen but confused? Okay, so a lot more falling into the marketing area on this one. Okay, so what is it about them that need that extra push? And what marketing tools might you think would work best with them? The keen but confused. Give you a second to type. Okay. okay, so these guys, again, they can also use education, right, because that helps clear up the confusion, right, so they're not as actively motivated to get the information, right, so it has to be a little bit more of a push, um, and again, 
it's not a bad idea if they're hearing that information from someone that they trust or know. Right, so maybe a government, you know, a government document or an ad isn't necessarily going to be as compelling as, say, their favorite social media influencer in terms of being able to decide where they want to go. So, in fact, this group could fall into either of those categories pretty nicely in terms of what would do the job. Okay, so some just need a little bit of a push with some information, and some of them need it to come from a particularly good source. Uh, and again, maybe a little bit of added incentive. Okay. Oops. All right, there we go. Now, what about our bandwagon hoppers? So these are our fashion, our fashionistas. What's going to motivate these guys, do you think? Okay, so that bam, 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 bam. There is nobody over in education and no one over in tactics right now. <laughs> that is exactly correct. Right, image is everything with these group, these guys, right? So it's gonna be all about the marketing toolkit, right? So they're, they're different than that other, the keen but confused is actually quite different in terms of how they'll respond. So they're 20% and 20%. So understanding those differences and how you would need to address both of them is pretty important, okay? Um, so we'll do it both ways. And then the apathetic and avoiders, what's gonna motivate these guys? process of elimination. This one should be pretty easy. Absolutely. These guys aren't going to do anything unless you force it on them. These are the sticks, right? So they need the tax incentive, right? They need to know their car is going to be taken off the road or they're just not going to do anything. Okay. The other thing to notice about it is it's actually, it has to be significant, the taxation, right? So the latest literature is showing that even like even up to 15% tax increase isn't enough, right? Like, and think about what an 15% more on the cost of gas is going to be, right? It's not enough to do it. It needs to be really high. And so if you look at some of the gas prices in some of the European and Scandinavian countries, in Australia, even, even in Canada, right? They're significantly higher than they are in North America, or sorry, in the United States. North America is me. I live there too, <laughs> right? Um, and you'll see some pieces, I believe, and I'm not in the States, so I hesitate to say this because things change, but there are some states where gas prices are higher, right? Because the state is trying to incent less pollution, less cars on the road, all those kinds of things, right? So um, that's where you see it. So overall, we see the keen but confused education, and again, our little Save the Planet people, um, education, definitely a good way, and there is some room right to get into that marketing side and that will have an impact on that group okay you really actually in some ways you don't have to do anything with the activists but you know they do like information but they'll seek it out themselves right and so you don't have to do you don't have to try too hard bandwagon hoppers entirely it's all about the sales pitch right and making it look popular uh, and again those ap apathetic avoiders it's going to be legislation i added this little arrow though um, for a reason, and it's because there's still a branding factor, right? They're still going to buy one brand or, over another, and the rebate side, right? So there's still an extrinsic reward that's money related, right? So whenever you have a naysayer, money is pretty much the fun fundamental driver. So it's going to be the tax which increases the price, but they will also potentially respond to a decrease in price, even if they don't care about the reason that it's being offered, right? So if they're choosing between two cars and one has a rebate and one doesn't, and they're about the same price, it might be the tipping point to make those kinds of decisions, okay? And that I believe is all I wanted to talk about today because we didn't have a huge amount of time and we still do have those 15 minutes left for questions, uh, which I am happy to field now. And so I understand Max and Ty are gonna tell me what to do from here. Wonderful, thank you um, for that. And uh, that polling uh, uh, software was pretty cool. I'm glad to learn about that. Um, so yes, um, Max and Ty, feel free to um, rejoin us here. Um, be happy to see you. Folks uh, who are attending, um, if you have questions, please uh, send them to us through the q and A. I I think also, um, I learned last time, I think you do have the ability to raise your hand. If you'd like to um, raise your hand, you are welcome to. And I think we can figure out 
uh, how to let you unmute yourself. Um, and so I'm gonna see um, Max or Ty, if either of you have a question that you would like uh, to get us started with. I am just that good. There are no questions. I always have questions, but I try to restrain myself. <laughs> I, I could have also just pummeled a whole bunch more of information in there and not had any questions, but I didn't want to be that person. Jesus. So I, I actually question and we'll go right through to the end. And I, I realized, you know, I didn't, um, I, I tend not to sort of read canned bios, um, but it, I would be interested to hear a little bit more about how you got into this field, you know, um, hearing from our students, you know, none of our environmental studies students have taken any courses in marketing. Um, how did you come to this? Um, it would be interesting for us to hear just about, you know, your personal um, academic uh, professional direction. How do you got where you are? Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really interesting question because I certainly didn't start off studying in the area of social marketing. Uh, I started studying emotional decision making, actually. So it was very much just social psychology. Uh, and the idea of irrational decision making, right, was something that I was just fascinated by. Why do we continue to make such bad decisions for ourselves? <laughs> and so after you know, the, the, the flip side of why do we make bad decisions is how do we help people make better decisions? So I think that was really the transition that led me into this area and social marketing, the practice of just figuring out, you know, the psychology of what makes people tick to help them figure out how to make those better decisions applies to a huge range of areas. Like I said, I've looked at um, you know, anti-smoking campaigns, I've looked at drinking and driving, I've looked at obesity related campaigns. Recently, I was looking at um, how to get people to go into depression treatment. Uh, and so mental health related um, studies and looking at different segments of people and how you could convince certain groups of people that may not typically be comfortable uh, entering treatment to enter treatment. So um, just by using different kinds of messaging. So that sustainability is just another logical choice. So this is fuel efficiency. Right now I'm working in the area of water uh, and freshwater sustainability. So. Great, thank you for that. I'm finding my mute button for a moment, unmuting there. Um, so I think that uh, Ty may have uh, a question for us. Is that right, Ty? Yeah. Great, thanks. My question was, why do you like think that the percent of people who would want to buy, like would pay more money for a sustainable car has been like dropping? Um, so I don't think it's the number of people that would buy one, but it's the amount they're willing to pay extra is dropping, right? So the, the people are the same, but their expectations are actually increasing, right? So and particularly with the millennial generation and your generation, um, there's a lot more of an expectation, a lot more pressure on companies and brands to do the right thing, uh, not just in terms of climate, but even on social issues, right? So brands now, even after Black Lives Matter came out last week or last year, there was an expectation that brands would take a stand in a way that would not have been expected before. And that I think is the reason that the willingness to pay extra um, is disappearing because we're just expecting more from companies. That is really interesting. That was one of my questions too. So I'm glad you asked that one, Ty. <laughs> I didn't have to. Um, so I do see that Tyler has his hand up. So I'm going to, um, huh, maybe ask, uh, well, let's see. Ty, if you can unmute yourself, feel free to. Otherwise, I'm going to have to ask Jackie for help because I'm not seeing um, that I can unmute Tyler. Um, Jackie, probably, you're... Probably the host. There, wait, there's Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... Huh, interesting. There hey, Tyler, are. I think we can hear you. All right, great. Yeah, I got a question for you. Sure. Yeah, I was just curious, what has a larger carbon footprint, the burning of fossil fuels, the power of the grid that charges electric vehicles, or just driving a gas-powered vehicle? <laughs> you just asked me the most controversial question <laughs> on the planet, I think, and I do not have an answer because it is the most controversial question on the planet. Um, I would suggest long-term, if you think about the replacement of gas vehicles with electric, 
uh, that is probably in some ways worse because then we're digging up all the existing gas stations and all of that um, infrastructure and having to dispose of it. So one of the things we talk about in sustainability is cradle to grave or cradle to cradle um, product design, right? So how do we determine all of the pieces of the supply chain from digging something out of the ground to manufacturing to consumption to also disposal? Uh, what, what kinds of impact are we seeing on the environment? And because we have such huge infrastructure related to gas powered cars right now, if we were to try to entirely replace it, um, instead of just leaving it there or doing something else with it, um, disposal on that side is massive. Uh, and I don't know to what extent that's been studied or looked at, because uh, usually we look at just the more, we're a very short term country. Uh, and a very short term uh, continent actually. So if you asked someone who lived in China this question, they would probably have a better or very different answer uh, than I, what I would have. But we tend to look at the short term impacts. Uh, so short term impact, definitely EVs are less. Long term impact, that's a great question. I don't know if that fully answers it, but that's what I've got. Yeah, it. well, there is a, we have a few different, um, a few different folks that are uh, contributing here. So one that's uh, directly related to that was, uh, um, from the chat, uh, I think from Cindy here, oh, yeah. um, but does battery manufacture and disposal re result in a great deal of harm? Yeah, and there's, yes, I think it, the battery disposal is definitely pretty devastating to the environment. Um, but the long-term emissions of, you know, using a conventional vehicle over 40 years, um, it's hard to say, right? But definitely, I think we, you're right, we don't think about the, the impact of disposal of batteries. It's the same actually, Cindy, with uh, solar panels. We don't think about disposal of solar panels. So. Okay, so I, um, okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. There's I see a few other things. So more, there's comments about batteries yeah. that they can be there's reused. And they have a lot of... There's a legit Q and A question though, so I feel like. Yep. Okay. I'll yep. So here, <laughs> here's what we're gonna do. So I, I was gonna uh, trying to get this in order here. Um, yeah. We're gonna try to let. Oh, here we go. I have some more control here. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I see Beverly Sherman uh, has yeah. a hand raised. So I'm gonna. Uh, I think I can allow uh, you to unmute. Okay. Um, and feel free to ask your question. Thank you. Sorry. There you are. Yeah, are. you can hear me now? Sure can. Yes, we can. See you sure, right. sure. Well, one of the things I did about eight years ago was buy a Prius. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to buy it because I was told it was going to be very fuel efficient and I was going to save money on gasoline which it certainly did. But what was also very nice, it has been, I still have the car and use it. It was a very comfortable driving car. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it really, it was there, it's been very fuel efficient and I've been very pleased with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I would guess too, Beverly, is it quieter? Beverly, is, is your car quieter? It's, it's very quiet, yes. Yeah, so noise pollution is also something we don't take into account quite a bit, but certainly the hybrids and the electrics are, are also quite quiet. Um, in terms of the short-term versus long-term cost, Beverly, were you comfortable with that choice? Because Prius did cost more yes. uh, than the upfront cost. I, I've been very, very happy I made that decision. It was more expensive but in the long run, I think I did a lot better. Yeah, great. Thank you for yeah. that. All right, great. Um, let's see, I think that Max was gonna take the next one here. Oh uh, yeah, so this is from the, the Q&A box. Okay. Uh, someone said, is there any way to get the apathetic types and avoiders to engage more in these issues? And what would work better, enticement or fear? Ooh, that's a really good question. Actually, we talk in behavior change, we talk about the fear motivation versus the positive messaging all the time. And we, you know, in the anti-BCD campaigns and things, that's a big, it's a big question. 
Um, and it varies by person, quite frankly. I don't think we have really good answers, but we are, start, we are starting to learn that fear doesn't work as well as we think, right? So in that drinking and driving campaign where it's like, you're gonna kill your friend and someone's gonna be smeared all over the, you know, the street, um, we're starting to learn actually those don't work very well. And up here, we have a campaign that's running right now called Be, uh, be a Good Wingman. Uh, and it's all focused around, you know, be a good friend and don't let your friend drink and drive, right? So it's really about peer relationships uh, more so than it is about the fear. And so we're still testing it to see how, how that actually is going to be working. Um, so in terms of getting the apathetics and the avoiders, I mean, the avoiders are just actively dead set against the issue usually, right? They are climate change deniers. Um, they think it's all blown up and it's fake and the hockey stick study didn't exist. And so they're going to be a really tough sell. But the apathetic awareness people, it is possible to change their thoughts and behavior, but it takes a lot of work. Right. And again, it's you really have to lean on the convenience factor and a lot of peer pressure. Right. So it would be up to kind of the committed and uh, maybe not even the committed activists, actually, because they're a little too preachy sometimes for this group, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but if you know, if it was their friends that were kind of in the middle of the road started to get on board. Right. And so they could almost become a little bit of a bandwagon hopper uh, with their friends. Right. It's a possibility. Um, if it's easy, right? But it really is about the easiness and not being too overt, not being too in your face, but it's, uh, it's not impossible to convert them. Um, but the other, the other guys, yeah, forget it. I think you're out of luck. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I'm, uh, before, um, uh, before we met here, we were having a conversation with the students and someone brought up, um, uh, motivator and uh, his purchasing a car was also looking at uh, winter weather and uh, driving in winter weather. And I'm wondering if that, does that just fall under safety? Or are there regional um, differences uh, in terms of buying preferences um, that uh, the only In terms of winter weather and like the fuel efficient vehicle side, the only thing I can think of, there was some initial concern um, about temperature and batteries. Right, so in extreme cold areas like where I live, <laughs> there would be a concern about whether they would be less likely to start and if it would actually be less efficient or if it would drain the battery too quickly to try and keep the car moving. But I think we've seen some of those days go by uh, just because the technology is improving with the batteries, right? It's the same way that, you know, uh, you know many years ago with the Prius, you know, the concern was, is, does, is it as powerful, right? You know, are, am I having to sacrifice some of their performance for the fuel efficiency? But it wasn't necessarily the case. The Prius was one of the ones that had really sold people on the fact that you could have it all. Uh, so I think this we're starting to see the same to be true with the electric vehicles. Um, so where we do see differences in terms of sustainability, it's not really around the fuel, but it's around things like winter tires and, you know, legislating better driving behavior in other areas. So. All right. So I think I just have one last question for you here as we near the end. And that is, um, I just wonder if you have any sort of advice to the, the college students uh, that are on the call here who may be interested in helping to um, uh, encourage their peers to uh, make sustainable car choices when they ever have uh, the money to be able to purchase a car. Um, if you haven't, I'd be curious to know what they might <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and I think that depends usually on where you are in life, right? So I think the college, the average college student uh, ends up choosing well uh, in some ways, unless they're buying a car from the 1970s. Um, you know, the, the older, smaller cars that you can typically afford are quite fuel efficient, right? So, so small vehicles is where you tend to start. So I think the advice really comes for when you're moving up, right? And when you're ready to buy your first new car or you know the, the larger vehicle so i think we have a tendency as we get older to want the suv right you're starting to see smaller cars not even being made in as much volume anymore um, that's your opportunity to say hey maybe i'll get an electric maybe i'll get a hybrid electric 
um, and plan to hold on for it, to it for a little longer so that I do get the bang for my buck. And you're, you're not only are you going to get your money back, there's going to be less longer term emissions and again, less waste, right? There's no reason that we need to be buying a new car every five or six years, right? We just do it because I feel like it, right? Uh, and the cars are lasting longer and longer, actually. Um, so that would be my, probably my biggest piece of advice. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, thank you for, for speaking today and thanks to our student moderators. Uh, thanks to all of you attending. I hope you'll come back and join us next week um, to hear uh, about um, what factors influence consumer demand for green power. Um, and uh, I hope all of you stay warm, especially up north in Canada <laughs> where it is so very cold today. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much to all of you. And again, thank you night. so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity. So enjoy the rest of the seminars. Thanks very much. <laughs> Bye-bye.